let's start with the obvious. Rafael Lozano Hemmer is an artist. You can even say maybe he's an electronic artist. But don't call him a new media artist, because according to him, what's so new about new media? He's inspired by phantasmagoria, the carnival, by perverting current technologies such as robotics, computerized surveillance, or telematic networks, he makes what he calls anti-monuments for alien agency, platforms for public participation that galvanize the masses into activated publics, transforming individuals into people and altogether making systems of the status quo misbehave. He's had solo exhibitions at SFMOMA, the Fundacion Telefonica de Buenos Aires, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Sydney. He was the first artist to officially represent Mexico at the Venice Biennale. He's shown at numerous art biennales and triennales, including the ones at Havana, Istanbul, Liverpool, Montreal, Moscow, the list goes on. He's received two BAFTA British Academy Awards, a Golden Nika at the Priest Art uh, Ars Electronica, and Artist of the Year Rave Award from Wired Magazine. He's also a recipient of the Rockefeller Fellowship. However, this is the info you can just crib from his bio. In really thinking and reflecting on Raphael's work, I was somewhat reminded of the verses of Pablo Neruda's The Book of Questions, full of questions that touch about inarticulate truths, questions like, why doesn't Thursday talk itself into coming after Friday? Questions like, what do Ruby say standing before the juice of pomegranates? Questions like, Will Czechoslovakians or turtles be born from your ashes? Questions like, which lands do the 70 degree vortexes blow? All at once comic, absurd, and poignant, and unanswerable. And similarly is the encounter with Raphael's work. Poetic encounters to que questions we forgot to ask. What happens to our presence when we are not there? What is illuminated by shadows? What measure is a breath? Whose heartbeat do we dance to? And how can one get a job at the Anti-Monuments for Aliens Agency? To answer these, or perhaps raise more, please welcome Rafael Lozano Hemmer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And Osman, it's a delight to be here. It's my very first time speaking in Michigan. Um, I am a Mexican-Canadian. We, we have a joke about that. Um, we don't call ourselves Chicanos. We're Chicanadians. Um, we also call ourselves Mexicanucks, or the really uh, annoying one is we call ourselves not wetbacks, but very wetbacks, because by the time you're in Canada, you've crossed not just the Rio Grande, but Mississippi, Great Lakes, you're soaking wet by the time you're in Canada. Um, for the past 20 years, I've um, dedicated uh, my work to two lines uh, of work. I called um, one half of them uh, anti-monuments, and the other one, the other half is subsculptures. And what I'll do in this presentation is show you a bunch of videos of works that sort of illustrate both approaches. Um, but mostly, I'm working at the intersection of performance art and architecture. And so I'll show you how um, using, often using technologies, um, people um, self-represent through my works. So I'll start right away with uh, 1992. Um, this is a time when a lot of people were um, first discovering virtuality. And um, for one of my very first artworks, um, we developed this eye that basically has a sensor that detects where the public uh, walks. This is right after the uh, first Gulf War, the first intelligent bombs. So we were very interested in how these technologies kind of had their own agency, and they sort of looked out into the real space. Originally, we were working in theater, and at the end of the theater, the dancers um, and the actors would sort of move away, and the public was invited to show them that the eye um, really did um, sort of follow where, where they were. 
1999, I got uh, a, a big commission to transform the Sokolo Square in Mexico City. Um, if you're familiar with the square, it's uh, a very um, sort of spoken for space. It's uh, a space that fits 330,000 people, so it's one of the, it's the third largest in the world. And it's very difficult, uh, this was for the arrival of the year 2000 in Mexico City, to actually do something in an area that is already so over uh, described. So um, what I did is I studied the sky, which was one of the only spaces that wasn't taken over. And we looked at the usage of searchlights. On the top left, you have the 19th century um, world exhibition in Paris where these searchlights were the, the arrival of modernity, this new energy called electricity. Um, on the top right, you have Albert Speer's uh, Nuremberg Nazi rally where the lights were used to create spectacles of intimidation. You know, the message was, we are big, you are small. And then after the Second World War, those same searchlights used for aircraft surveillance were used for victory parades. And so now we associate the usage of searchlights with something like Times Square um, celebrations or the opening of a new shopping mall. But most problematic than all is uh, Jean-Michel Jarre's uh, $46 million extravaganza in the pyramids of Egypt, where to celebrate the year 2000, the Egyptians brought in this French um, uh, artist to create this parade of, uh, of identitarian representation of, of Egyptians, um, which only 4,000 people saw. So you can notice that I'm a bit bitter in part because I'm envious of his budget, but also because I find it really problematic that this whole sort of approach of Son et Lumière, this big light and sound shows, are always trying to tell you like a, a very pedagogical or didactic presentation of who we are as a people. So what was my proposal? Measuring my proposal was to um, take um, 18 of the world's most powerful searchlights and place them in the buildings uh, surrounding the Sokolo, creating this grid-like grid lattice, and measure them with GPS trackers. And anybody who would go into a website called alzado.net could in fact direct each and every one of those searchlights to create large light sculptures over the Sokolo Square. So the idea is instead of having some kind of celebration of fireworks and, and, uh, and this kind of parade of Mexican heroes or virtual muralism, instead what we decided to do is to create a platform for people to be the ones who would generate the content of the piece itself. So what you're seeing here is an interface. This is 1999, so it was a big deal to be able to simulate in 3D what the effect would actually be in the city. It's all done in Java in 3D. Um, and then, once you were happy with your design, you would send it to Mexico, where uh, on a first-come, first-served queue, every night from uh, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., new designs would be rendered by the lights in the night sky. So this scene right here is on the 3rd of January at uh, 2 in the morning or something like that, and the lights are just constantly moving uh, as they receive the, the messages from the internet, the designs from the internet. One of the nice things about Mexico City is we have a lot of pollution, and so the lights um, have this kind of natural haze. It's almost like a smog or, or a fog machine. So they were visible over a 10-mile radius. And there was no proscenium, no sort of privileged viewpoint for VIPs to be able to see the piece. It's just constantly transforming. All of your peripheral vision is taken over by these lights moving. This scene here is on the 28th of December at like 8 p.m. But it's not paralyzing anybody to just sort of take this passive spectacle. It's just, I, I like to compare it more to a fountain than to um, a, a, a show, you know, like some kind of pre-programmed uh, cathartic spectacle. Now you'll notice how every time that a design appears in the night sky, it stops for a, a brief uh, instant. And what we would do is automatically, we would photograph that design from three or four webcams, and then we would build a web page for each and every participant documenting their design. So you have uh, here an example. Um, on the left are the virtual views, what you actually did from home or from work or from school. And on the right, the actual photographs taken at the time when you did your design from the exact same vantage points to show you that what you did really did take place. And that was important in Mexico in 99 because um, the PRI was still in power. We'd been voting against them for 80 years and nothing had happened. So the idea that 
participation was a vehicle for transformation was important, that they could get back uh, a feedback, that they could personalize the space. And on the top right of each web page, you see there, there's comments. Most of the comments are things like, I dedicated this design to Margarita, who's at the hospital, I hope you get better. But we got everything from political messages, poems, we got marriage proposals, of, all sorts of stuff. And those messages were completely uncensored, which was an, another big deal in Mexico at the time, because the Zapatista rebellion was very active electronically, so we wanted to make sure that people could say whatever they wanted. We got 800,000 participants um, from 89 countries, and 70% of the traffic was from Mexico itself. Internet. Ah, sí, vamos a verlas. No, más que nada son sistemas computarizados manejados de luces, pero no, no, no interviene nada de Internet. Sí, son el, sistemas. Sí, sí, interviene ¿Esto porque sí es Internet. Viene, sí. Cada, cada, de, de cada parte de la República hicieron sus diseños para que aquí juntaran las luces y se vieran Revista en cinco él. minutos. Los diseños y pasan el nombre y la dirección del chavo que los hizo. Y ahora que venimos al Zócalo, vemos las luces y ahora decimos, ahora estamos en un Hollywood, pero mexicano. Sí, muy, muy bueno. Que es una obra de arte. Uno mismo manda su diseño. El mejor es el que hace así el techo. Le preguntaba que si tenían algún significado cruzados y todo eso, por la cuestión de las postulaciones. De hecho, este, nos parece una... una... And through the media and through word of mouth, people would find out that if those lights were moving, it's because somebody was participating. It's a humbling situation to be an artist that makes this kind of platforms, because if no one participates, the piece literally turns itself off and there is nothing to show. Now, this project, Victorial Elevation, has been shown in many cities, um, most recently at the Vancouver Olympics in, in uh, 2010. This is the uh, same project, same lights, but better camera, so it gives you more the sense of, of the kind of effect that you get. This is in Lyon, in uh, the Place Belcourt, and you see the people on the bottom. They are just walking around and spending time in public space. I believe very firmly that that's what I'm looking for. Um, I'm looking for people to occupy public space in an activity other than shopping. Um, how can we take over our cities and create um, experiences which are eccentric, which invite people to congregate and to explore together um, some creative element? So contrary to, for example, the work of, of Albert Speer, where the lights were used to create spectacles of intimidation, here we're trying to create intimacy. We're trying for people to personalize the public space, make their designs, see them up um, in the sky, and uh, in that way establish a relationship with their city. After I did that project, I became the searchlight artist, and that's something you really don't want to be. So um, I sort of varied it. I got a commission to do a project in, uh, in Rotterdam, and as part of my scouting for, for this project, I found this uh, beautiful engraving from Samuel von Hoogstraten, who was a disciple of Rembrandt, that uh, uh, did this beautiful shadow dance representation. Basically, like with Rembrandt, von Hoogstraten used shadow plays to uh, explain perspective to, to their students um, in their studios. And one of the things I love about this particular engraving made in Rotterdam in the 17th century is that the larger shadows are demonic or monstrous, whereas the smaller ones are angelic and pure. So there's a relationship between the scale of amplification and and, uh, and what you're representing. So with that excuse, we made a very large shadow play in the Scalberg plane in Rotterdam. So basically, this is a project um, where we took thousands of pictures of people from the city where the project is shown, and then we're projecting them 60 foot high over a facade of a cinema building. And then we have very, very powerful projectors who are washing out, if you will, all of the portraits. So two projectors are on towers projecting portraits, two projectors are on the floor level washing them out. As you cross the path of the bottom projectors, your shadow is cast onto the building. And very naturally, people would sort of walk close to or far from the facade, and your shadow would grow from six foot all the way up to 60 feet high. 
and a very sort of uh, impromptu kind of performance would begin where people would naturally match the scale of their shadow with the scale of one of the portraits uh, taken in the streets. And an animation, like a natural, uh, we call it reverse puppetry, would it be ensued where you'd um, animate the, 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 the people. And rarely did we see the, the, the actual person that was creating the shadow be the person inside, but it did happen and it was straight out of David Lynch. So um, this project, for instance, was in Rotterdam for three weeks, every night, um, again from 6 p.m. to midnight. And uh, there was no score, there was no instruction. You would just literally stumble upon this project and find somebody inside of your shadow. <laughs> and contrary to, to most interfaces like Victorial Elevation, the Searchlight Project, you need instructions. Here you don't, because with um, shadows, everybody has a very sophisticated vocabulary of what can be done. Most cultures have like a tradition of shadow theater, shadow puppetry. We all play with shadows at night. And so it's a very intuitive interface that people would start playing with it. Technologically, we had a computer vision system that we developed, which would sort of tell the computers when a shadow and a portrait overlapped. And when that happened, we would trigger a little MIDI sound in public space, like tick, just to sort of let people know that they had activated, that they sort of revealed that shadow. And more importantly, once all of the portraits in a given scene were revealed, automatically the system would switch to a new set of portraits. It would black out the scene, cue a new image, and invite people to reorganize in public space. Because the idea with this project was not, a, it wasn't about the projects, it was about becoming the, por the, the portraits. So you see in this next scene, um, several people collaborate. They map or they match all of the different portraits. Computer blacks out, cues a new image, um, and the system begins again, and so people reorganize in public space. Now, the kind of thing that we ended up seeing um, in this kind of project is very diverse. We had a man on a wheelchair project himself 60 foot high, crush everybody under his wheels, and derive a lot of pleasure from this. Had a, a man brought his little chihuahua dog, which was trembling, but it was huge, and everybody was underneath the dog. I mean, it was all very, very fun. Um, and, um, and it depends also on the time of, of the week, for instance, or the time of night. In the weekends, we'd had lots of kids. Tuesdays was methadone night at the nearby church so that all the drug addicts would come out and prance around. It really depended on, on, um, on what time. For the nerds, like myself, um, we revealed the, the tracking system, the surveillance system, projected right in public space together with an explanation in English and Dutch to explain how the system worked. And we call that, pretentiously, we call that the Brechtian moment, just to sort of reveal what the mechanism for surveillance is. But the truth is that most people didn't really care about the surveillance. They would just immediately start these ad hoc uh, narratives and start playing with each other. So you'd get this kind of thing. So for instance, she, she abused her boyfriend for about three hours. <laughs> and so, and as you can see, so a lot of people didn't really care about the portraits. They just sort of wanted to see themselves in an architectural scale, which is fine by me. So um, with this project, as with most of my projects in public space, what I'm seeking to do is to create a platform that is out of my control. This is the single most important objective of my work, is how do we make something 
where you're not told what to do or not to do. Everybody sort of comes up with their same, with their own uh, narrative. They interact with each other and, uh, and they occupy space. They take it over. Um, they personalize it. And these kind of brief interruptions to the homogeneity of public space is what um, really, you know, excites me. Um, I think um, we're living in a particularly dangerous moment in, in urban planning and global, in globalization and architecture where there's an enormous homo homogenization going through, right? Like new building in Detroit is bound to be very similar to one in Mexico City, not because, you know, these buildings no longer represent the citizens around them, they represent capital, right? So the solutions that architects, developers, urban planners and so on have are very similar um, from city to city. So this homogeneity is really frustrating. How can we create a sense of entitlement or relationship to the public that um, enjoys these buildings? Um, and I think that that's the challenge that many artists uh, are trying to address, is how to, um, to, uh, yeah, to personalize the space. So this is the same project, but in a different square. This is in the Hauptplatz in, in, in uh, Austria. And then as we do this project in different cities, we see that the projects are not site-specific, right? Um, they're what I call relationship-specific, which is to say the projects do move from city to city, and the performance that you see out of the project in the end really depends on, on the city itself. So, for example, my stereotype of Portuguese people or Latinos in general is that we like to touch each other very much. Our distance, the public distance is very, very close. And yet when we showed this project in Portugal, everybody was like, no, you don't touch my shadow, I'm right here, you're over there. Um, whereas when we first showed it in England, I had never worked in England, and my stereotype of British people is that there's, you know, propriety and class and stiff upper lip and all these things. And in fact, when we showed this project in Liverpool, immediately people would start getting naked and just, you know, throwing this incredible um, sort of scenes of debauchery. Uh, it was really exciting. Uh, this is it in Hong Kong, etc. So, um, similar project um, with shadow. So I, I really locked onto the shadow as a way to make uh, a participant uh, comfortable with uh, the relationship of images. And um, this project, which was most recently being shown in Trafalgar Square, it's also a portraiture project. Thousands of people from the city where the project is shown are recorded. And this time, though, they're, they're actually interactive videos. So when you find one of these portraits in your shadow, they find you. They wake up and they check you out. So they know um, that you are there. And from a, a rest position, they kind of um, wake up and check you out. It's kind of, it's again, a, a strange kind of relationship, eye contact, because it sets you up in a, in a sense of intimacy. The person is always at the right sort of scale and, and uh, occupies all of your shadow. Um, if you stay in front of them, they just, we, we call that scrubbing. We, the playhead just goes fa backward and, and, and forward, uh, just checking you out. Not, not a loop, but, but just like a state of suspension. And then if you're not interested in the portrait, you just walk away. And as you walk away, the portrait um, goes back to sleep and disappears. So this kid is looking at this one, walks away portrait disappears, and then it never shows up again. Um, or, or, you know, it's, it's, it's random with memory, so it, 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 it will never repeat until after a thousand portraits. Um, and like the Hogstrat and the engraving that we saw from the Dutch, you know, indeed, the, there is a lot of invitation for this kind of violence. Um, there is um, this sense of, uh, of um, relationship. Um, so with this project, we're using a, a, a very bright projector. Um, we, I, I, I always joke that my work is as big as my insecurities, so I try and get the world's biggest projector, biggest balloon, whatever. But now I go to psychotherapy, so I'm also doing little things, so it's, it's getting better. So this is a very bright projector casts your shadow onto the ground. And then we have these robotic projectors which can place the, um, the portraits anywhere within uh, 20,000 square feet in the square. 
And most importantly, we have this tracking system, surveillance system, that not only detects where people are, but you see those crosshairs over there? That's actually where people will be in the future, three seconds into the future. So it tries to calculate that. And we use that information because we want the computer to find which projector can actually cast a portrait in your path. So the portraits don't come to you, you always go to them. Um, and all of that sort of technological part um, needs to be moderately um, sort of invisible. So when you're actually trying the project, it just works. But as you can imagine, we're actually projecting from all sides, so the computers are taking care of all of the rotation and the distortion and the scaling of each one of the portraits. So from your perspective, it just works. It's like there's somebody inside of you. But um, technologically, it's, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Now, um, let me just fast forward. Doo -doo. So these are um, some of the thousands of people who were recorded. Now, they're recorded by local filmmakers of the city um, in these rigs that we sort of set up outside of rock concerts in community centers and universities, museums, whatever. And the portraits are, we, we invite people to do whatever they want to self-represent. The only thing we ask is at one point, look straight at the camera. And that's the moment that we trigger when your shadow uh, uncovers a portrait. So, you know, a lot of people just sort of wave their hands. Some do sign language. Um, it's England, so a lot of people get naked. Um, as, as now I know, uh, that's what British people like to do. Um, and then um, this guy says, you look because I'm not homeless. So this idea of, of perhaps the content is not very um, sophisticated, but on the other hand, it has a lot of immediacy or it has a lot of um, um, relationship to the, to the town. Okay. Um, in 2006, I got uh, an opportunity to transform this um, textile factory from the 19th century in the state of Puebla. It's, um, it's a project called Pulse Room, and uh, it's basically a sensor, not unlike what you might find at a gym, that detects your heartbeat. Um, and then it converts it into flashes in that incandescent light bulb that you see there. And the way that this project works, let me show you. So at the beginning, there's no, nothing, and so I go first, can't help myself, narcissistic megalomaniac, and so this is my heartbeat. The computer records it, then when I release the sensor, the computer loops my heartbeat and it puts it on the very first light bulb in the whole room. Then here comes the second participant, the mother of the sponsor, and um, she records her heartbeat. And notice how it's different, not only in the rate, but also the attack on the tungsten filament. We actually get 11 different variables, systolic and diastolic activity of the heart and so on. When she releases, the computer loops that heartbeat and it sends it to the first light bulb. And mine moves down one position down the array to the second light bulb. Here comes a third participant who is my friend who likes to drink a lot of Red Bull. What does Red Bull do? Boom, boom, boom. So now his is added, and again, we all shift one position. Here comes a curator uh, who thinks we're going to electrocute everybody. So what happens inside the heart of a curator? Let's take a look. <laughs> okay, he's really freaking out. And so you get the idea. Once 100 people have participated, the entire room gets filled with the vital signs of the participants. And then, more importantly, once 100 people participate after you, your own heartbeat disappears from the room, like a little memento mori, a little reminder of our fleeting time in this installation. Um, this piece and many others that I've been doing with pulses um, was originally inspired by um, uh, my wife was pregnant with twins, a boy and a girl, and being a nerd, I asked the doctors to let us have two ultrasounds at the same time so that we can hear the heartbeat of the boy and the heartbeat of the girl at the same time, and they were very different. And they created this kind of syncopated music that I enjoyed very much. So the idea is, well, how can we take that and make it into something um, broader? So that's a project called Pulse Room. Um, I took that project to the Venice Biennale, where I was fortunate to be um, 
representing Mexico. We also did this other project in um, the Biennale. It's basically an animatronic installation. It's uh, Eames designed chairs with a sarinen base that is modified. And then as you walk past it, um, the chairs detect you and they create a wave. And then if no one's there, they just go quiet. So the idea with this kind of installation is to create a tension between, well, who is the observer and who is the observed, right? As you walk in, you see these chairs, you think there's going to be a talk or something like that, but then as you walk around, the chairs start behaving eccentrically. So I'm very interested by the idea of taking a modular system, uh, a formulaic or polymeric system like Eames and, and Sarinen, and then, you know, as a homage in a way, to create situations where those chairs have, um, you know, moments of, of independence or of, 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 of fancy, right? They, they, they just sort of move on their own. And again, uh, the Brechtian moment, we always show the tracking system um, so that nerds like myself or whoever wants to see how the system actually works, they can actually have it revealed. Funny story, when we showed this project in Venice, my gallery said we should have stanchions and chains to prevent people from sitting on the chairs. And I said, of course not, you know, like, no one's going to sit on them. They can see that it's, they're moving, they're, they're the artwork. And within seven minutes of opening the Venice Biennale, like a big guy went and sat on him and broke one of the chairs. He was a curator at the Guggenheim. And I told him, uh, you break it, you buy it. Um, but it didn't work. So, so then we did put some chains in the end. All right. Same idea as the project that you saw in Mexico, except now using a, a, a different uh, sort of scale. So this is Madison Square Park in uh, New York City. And um, in this time, we're using 200 theatrical spotlights to represent the 200 heartbeats of the past 200 participants. So similar to the previous installation, there's a sensor in public space. You come in, you register your uh, heart's activity. And then in this version, the heartbeat actually gets amplified to take over all of the park so that the entire park is going to your heartbeat. And then when you release the sensor, same idea, your um, recordings get looped onto the very first light bulb, and everybody who participated before you gets pushed down one position. So creating this, this kind of um, effect or glimmer. Um, and I'm very interested in using biometrics. I, I'm using a lot of biometric technology recently because I do believe that we're living in a time when uh, identification, where surveillance, where sort of monitoring has just become such a normality that it's important to create intensely um, critical or poetic experiences that in a way um, you know, provide for, for, for the safety that supposedly those biometric systems were uh, about to give us, right? Um, it is only the politicians who think that we are safer with more cameras. Everybody else knows that the solution to things like terrorism is not more technology. The solution is much more complicated. It's to do with translation and exchange and respect and uh, re redistribution of wealth, etc. But our politicians don't think that. They think more technology will make us safer, and that's wrong. Um, but instead of that, then we can misuse these technologies to create environments that somehow will make people, you know, talk and sit in space and, uh, and create a more cohesive um, community, if you will. I know it sounds idealistic and utopian, but that's what I do. Um, most of the artists that I admire are people like Johann Goertz or Hans Hakes or Rachel Whiteread whose most interesting work for me is um, addressing very dark episodes of history. So the typical example is Johann Goertz's um, memorial to the Holocaust in, in uh, Hamburg. 
how do you represent the Holocaust, something like that. And what he did is he, with uh, his wife Esther Shalif Gertz, they made a beautiful sort of monolith, this sort of phallic black uh, prism um, that people could sort of scribble on. And over a period of time, this entire monolith descended into the ground and disappeared altogether. So today, if you go to Hamburg and you go to this square, you actually don't see the monument. You see just the, the floor, uh, sort of the overhead of the, of the monolith in the floor, and then it has a little pla plaque explaining what happened. So the burial, the disappearance of this monolith is how he chooses to represent um, this. And I find that really, really exciting because it's, um, uh, oftentimes all we see is this kind of uh, displace of names of, of who died or something like this. I got my opportunity to do a project like that. Um, in 1968, the Mexican government murdered around 300 students, it depends who you ask, 10 days before the Olympics. Um, and these peaceful students were in the Tlatelolco Square. That night they got murdered and, um, and all the blood was cleaned that very night. The media did not reply, you know, sort of report on this at all. And for about 30 years it was a, a taboo to speak about this event. And now Tlatelolco Square is part of the UNAM, the university, the, the Autonomous University of Mexico, which has now got a memorial and a cultural center. They invited me to sort of remember the 40th anniversary of the massacre and this is the project that we did. Um, so, um, just some backdrop, the, the, the square itself um, is surrounded by, you know, pyramids, by colonial buildings and by modern buildings, so it's called the Plaza of the Three Cultures. Um, snipers shot at the military, military shot back, and the students um, were murdered. So what we did for this project is instead of talking about that as if it was something that has, was finished, we invited people to participate in an open mic experiment. It was a megaphone that was placed on the site and which translated your voice into light. Pues muchas veces los dejamos en el olvido o solo recordamos la típica frase el 2 de octubre no se olvida, mas no estamos enterados de los hechos o la trascendencia que tuvo. Entonces es un llamado de exhortación tanto a los jóvenes como a los adultos, a todos aquellos que les interesa su libertad y vivir en un país con democracia, pues que hagamos conciencia y no nos conformemos con lo que nos dan. Eso es todo. Gracias. We participate in 1960. As people spoke, um, their voice would become light and it would hit, the, from the site of the massacre, it would hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the voices were unmoderated and uncensored. So we got a lot of um, survivors of the massacre, like this lady. Um, we got, uh, for instance, a fellow who said, my name's so-and-so, and I'm here to say my father was one of the soldiers who committed the massacre, and I've lived with his guilt all my life. I'm a new generation. Um, we had a fireman who came and said, my name's so-and-so, and I'm here to denounce that routinely the Mexican government was asking us to put um, uh, coloring in our water tanks, so when we spray protesters, they're easily identifiable, and I became a fireman to protect people, not to be part of the apparatus of oppression. Just non-stop, incredibly touching and vibrant stories, right? Um, it's this capability to take over that space and, uh, and just let people, um, you know, voice their concerns. And then importantly, to then visualize those concerns um, with these slides. So let me just fast forward so you can see what else happens in this project. So once the light would hit the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the three more lights, um, searchlights, would beam the sound or beam the, the, the message live to the rest of the city. Again, it could be seen from a 10-mile radius. And crucially, when you were in Mexico City, say you were in your car or at school or, or from home, you would see these flashing lights. You could tune into um, FM radio to 96.1 uh, FM 
and listen live to what the light was saying. So this was crucial, the capability for the sound to also be transmitted live and so that, you know, you sort of completed the circle of communication. Octubre 2, 1968, y los culpables no han sido castigados. Todo el sistema judicial mexicano es visto por la ciudadanía, según todas las encuestas, como algo ajeno y contrario a ella. Ahí están las matanzas del 10 de junio de 1971. So as you can imagine, people were not just talking about 1968, they were talking about the contemporary situation, um, about what the events are taking place still in Mexico to this date. Now, because it's a radio program, ultimately, this is 96.1 FM, is Radio Nam. you must have some programming. When there was nobody live, we would play back philosophers, uh, survivors, poets from 1968, from the actual riot, um, who would just sort of talk about uh, their experiences. And so we would mix their archival material with what was happening at this time. And in that sense, the project was this mixture of past and present. Now, not everything, of course, was, you know, um, all, all this memorial stuff. We also had shout-outs and rapping and poets and, of course, marriage proposals. So that was a lugubrious project. Um, next, I'll show um, a, a happier project. This is um, a piece commissioned uh, by GLOW in Santa Monica. It's a festival that takes place just one night. We have uh, two very powerful projectors on those cranes. And then you see down there two scaffold structures, which are basically large sandboxes. And so at night, what would happen is that people would come in and stick their hands into the sandbox. And as you did that, your um, image would be beamed into the beach so they could see you. But at the same time as this would happen, we also had powerful infrared computer surveillance on the beach so that you see those black dots walking around in the, in the, in the sandbox. That's the people from the beach. So you could see them and they could see you and you shared three scales. The tiny scale of the, of the model of the, of the sand, the huge scale of amplifi amplified uh, video, and then you were right next to each other so you can actually take turns in abusing other people or playing around with them. And pretty much like in the shadow place, there is no script or no, um, no content, right? These projects are completely devoid of content. Um, the content is entirely crowdsourced. And um, when we do projects like this, it's a problem at first, especially because, you know, say somebody is paying a lot of money to sponsor this project, you turn it on, and then they expect a show. But then there's nothing to see, right? Like, there's absolutely nothing to see. Until finally, like, usually some kid comes in and starts doing funny things, and then pe everybody gets involved and they start playing. So it's... Um, it's, a, it's a sort of strange kind of situation where you don't control the content. And it's LA, so people have their dogs with booties. Um, there's all sorts of break dancers. Um, let me just fast forward. Or this guy, for example, burns people. <laughs> so you get that kind of thing. Coca Cola can guy. So kind of the theory that, that, that we work with is like, well, if we do want to have safer cities, then what if our surveillance cameras became projectors, right? What if instead of assuming suspicion and taking people's and capturing their image and comparing them to a database of suspicious individuals or determining their race, um, what if they actually provided for um, opportunities to break um, the homogeneity? Um, the cameras that we used in this project, for instance, are cameras that are routinely used at the U.S.-Mexico border to track illegal Mexicans, or at the local shopping mall, um, you know, to track teenagers. So then how do we then visualize those same cameras in a way that will make us feel like uh, there's a sense of belonging? So that's Sandbox. Uh, 
Um, I, I'm, I'm only showing some, some projects. We, we, we are a large studio, we have 10 people, and so we we're quite prolific in, in what we do. Some of the projects about absence and presence and about the virtual and the real get manifested in installations that are more for museums like this one. Um, it's basically a scanner head, a conveyor belt. You put whatever you have in your pockets, you pick it up, and then it leaves behind an image of itself, and it plays back with other stuff that people put in in the past. So the system can actually remember up to 600,000 objects from the past, and the content itself is triggered um, from participation. So again, unless you put your own element into the conveyor belt, there will be nothing to see. But it is when you participate that you see something. We pretentiously call that what you give is what you get. <laughs> And I, this project premiered in England, and you would not believe uh, during the three months the stuff that people put in the conveyor belt. Everything from switchblades to sex toys, drugs, uh, credit cards, unbelievable stuff. It was really fun as a pop experiment. Um, again with the biometrics, but this time using a um, uh, digital microscope. You stick your finger into the orifice. I love to tell people to do that. Or oh, you must stick your finger in the orifice. Um, and then um, the system basically um, detects your heartbeat. You can see there an electrocardiogram. And then it shows your fingerprint uh, projected um, 18 foot high, or well, up to 18 foot high. And then it keeps it, and then it pushes all the previous people who have participated one cell over, like it shifts all of them. So in this particular version of the project in Sydney, Australia, we were showing the past 10,900 fingerprints um, from the past participants. We're getting closer to the present. Tape recorders. Um, we've been developing our, developing our own tracking systems for 20 years, and then Microsoft came up with a Kinect, and, and it's, it's, it was devastating. We absolutely love their product. Um, and so now we're using it. This was our first Connect project. What it is, it's um, 68 uh, tape measures. And when you're walking around the gallery, the Connect detects you. And then if you stand in front of a particular um, tape measure, the tape measure will just continue to telescope up and up and up. Now these tape measures, instead of measuring distance, they measure time. So, until the beautiful moment where it becomes metastable and it crashes. Um, and so in this project, it's basically just a bunch of measuring tapes that keep crashing. And then once they crash, they recoil back onto their position. Um, and so, crucially, in the gallery, we also have this printer that prints out every half hour or every hour the number of the, the amount of time wasted by the public. Installation. Um, back to large things. This is a fake sun. It's the world's largest spherical balloon, um, and it's. Um, exactly 100 million times smaller than the real sun. It's um, right now, well, well, in this video, we see it flying in Melbourne, Australia. And that night, we use uh, five projectors to project onto it the turbulence at the surface of the sun. So we worked with NASA um, both to work with the latest imagery from SOHO and SDO, but also with the actual mathematics that generate the turbulence. So things like reaction diffusion, Berlin noise, Navier-Stokes, fractal flames. So the actual animation of the fake sun is not a video recording. It's actually um, sort of parametric equations that are constantly coming up with new content for it. And because it's not a recording, we can actually interact with it. Um, it, it actually has 11 different seasons, this sun. Um, let me just show you. Boop, boop, boop. 
So if you have a tablet or a smartphone, you can um, choose those seasons or you can actually pass your fingers and as you do that, you actually seed the equation. So you see those dots on the surface of the sun, that's your finger actually creating more turbulence um, on it. Um, so this kind of project is, is meant to create like a landmark um, or to, you know, just sort of ref refer a little bit to, um, to the question of scale. If you were to take the whole Earth and make it 100 million times smaller, it would be something as much smaller than your fist. And so comparatively, it's interesting. And te technically, I, I don't know how many of you are, 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 are nerds here, but you, know, you look at it and you go, oh yeah, well, you, know, you just project some images onto a balloon. It's not so easy. Balloons bob and sway. So we actually had to calibrate the balloon so that we know where it is in three dimensions at every given time, and we actually coordinate so that the computer graphics are always matching the movement of the balloon. So this is the kind of thing that you don't see, but, but you just look at it and, it and it does work. All right. Again, to the small stuff, this is a little branch that we found in the park and we hang it, and then what we do is we run, we scan it in 3D, and then we do an L system equation, which grows the entire tree from where the branch came. So the shadow of the branch is the full tree. Now I'm going fast because I know time is running out. Here is a, a project um, that, um, that I'm um, just developing. This, is, uh, this woman is Omara Portuondo. She's the singer for Buena Vista Social Club. And so we ask her to breathe into this brown paper bag. And then um, the brown paper bag has a lot of meaning in Mexico and Cuba uh, because it's how you measure food. Um, and then you hook up this brown paper bag with her breath into a machine that we developed at the studio, which is a, basically an artificial respirator that um, pumps the air through 10,000 times a day, which is the normal respiratory frequency for an adult at rest, um, in such a way that uh, Omara's breath is constantly inflating and deflating the, uh, the bag. And the piece also sighs 158 times a day. The machine literally goes <sighs> like that. The idea with this um, piece is that it's a biometric portrait. When Omara Portuondo dies, this piece is going to be in the National Museum of Music in Cuba. And you'll be able to go and see the last breath of Omara Portuondo. So it's this kind of ridiculous, absurd desire to capture the ephemeral, right? Like how can you capture someone's breath, especially somebody as important as she is. She is the voice of Cuba, right? Um, and then you put her into the machine and, and now there is this idea that somehow this captures some of her grandeur. Um, so it's at once um, a, 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 a project that is a memorial, but it's also a, a, a funny uh, project. Um, a, interesting, a funny story about this is we just, um, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal just uh, acquired this work. Um, and I said, it's a curatorial decision. Who is the person who goes into the, into the bag? And I suggested Leonard Cohen, the poet and singer, uh, who's from Montreal. And then they said, okay, we acquire your work, but the board wants to know if you would consider putting Celine Dion. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 not Celine. Um, and I had to be very quick with this. I said, no, um, you know, Celine is young. She's a young mother. This would be an insult to put her in one of these pieces. This is a memorial for someone who's over 70, over 80. Um, and so Leonard Cohen is back on. So final project to show you is an extension of what you just saw. It's called Vicious Circular Breathing. And um, it's at a different scale. It's a project which is best described as an asphyxiation machine. It's basically a room, it's a glass room, where you enter by pressing a button. You press that button and uh, these doors open into a decompression chamber. The decompression chamber gets rid of all the fresh air and then two more doors open into the main chamber where you're invited to sit down. As you sit down and you breathe, um, the entire um, um, room is hermetically sealed. So you're literally invited to breathe the air 
of that has already been briefed by everybody before you. Quite disgusting. There are um, warnings on the on the wall um, about what's happening, and um, there's you see that big tube that comes out of the asphyxiation room. It goes into these bellows, which are not unlike what you might find at an old organ, that pump the air into what we call a manifold. The manifold is this switching system that then controls um, 61 brown paper bags, which are kind of visualizing the actual movement of the air um, in the whole hermetically sealed system. And we use 61 bags because that's five octaves. We were sort of celebrating this kind of organ-like um, uh, reference. And I was very surprised because this is being shown right now in Istanbul and I thought nobody would go in it. I Certainly I wouldn't. Um, actually, I did go in, but I was the first one. So then it's kind of like safe because uh, I, I find it really disgusting. But the, the warning is like from the floor to the ceiling and it says, you know, as you go into the system, just three warnings. One is asphyxiation. So we are monitoring carbon dioxide and, and oxygen levels. And if it gets to a dangerous level, the doors open automatically. The second one is contagion. There are no filters at all in the system, so any viruses or germs, bacteria that is airborne, will, um, you will be breathing that. But that's not unlike what you might find at an elevator. And the third uh, warning is about panic, because in order to get out of the glass room, uh, you must press the button and wait for the whole decompression routine, but we've made now panic doors so that you can leave if you need to. And everybody tries it. It's really, really weird. Um, there is this idea, which we're trying to illustrate with this project, about the commons, right? The idea that the air that we breathe, the water we drink, the space, the ground, um, is something that is shared. And so what happens when we actually limit it and we create this vicious circle um, that is hermetically sealed? And questions about that kind of commons um, are coming up, especially in Turkey, where, as you may know, the government is just shutting down Gezi Park um, to create shopping malls, which are basically determining what public and private is. So, um, and this is the final sort of look of the, of the installation. So, that's my presentation. Um, I believe that um, right after here, we will exit this room, and for whoever wants to um, ask some questions, I would be uh, really happy to answer them in the room uh, to the left. Thank you. <laughs>